Hello, my name is Adele Tomlin, and in the second episode of the Kini Conversations, it is a great delight and honor to welcome Professor Janet Gatso, the first and current Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies at the Divinity School of Harvard University. In the Buddhist and Studies and Tibetology world, Professor Gatso really needs no introduction and is a prime example of a woman who has reached the peak of the academy while at the same time writing original and thought-provoking research about issues connected to women, feminism, gender, androcentrism, and Buddhism. If anyone might be awarded the title Queen of the Buddhist Studies Academy, Professor Gyatso would surely be a prime contender. Her books include Being Human in a Buddhist World, an intellectual history of medicine in early modern Tibet, Apparitions of the Self, the secret autobiographies of a Tibetan visionary, in the Mirror of Memory, Reflections on Mindfulness and Remembrance in Indian and Tibetan Buddhism, and Women of Tibet. Professor Gyatso has also been writing on sex and gender in Buddhist monasticism, and on the current female ordination movement in Buddhism. Her current writing concerns the phenomenology of living well with animals and related ethical issues and practices. So without further ado, Professor Gyatso, welcome to Dakini Conversations and a good evening here from India, and a good morning to you in America. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. And um, I'm always happy to have a Dakini uh, conversation. So. <laughs> okay, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to have you here as a guest. Now, um, for those of you who perhaps are not so aware of your background or haven't heard any of your previous interviews, I wonder if you could start with telling me a little bit about your background, where you're from, your family and your first connection into Tibetan Buddhism or Buddhism. Sure. So uh, yes, I'm was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA, and I was um, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish family on both sides. And I uh, went. I started at uh, uh, university at Boston University, and. In the middle, in my junior year, I, uh, some friends and I uh, went to uh, listen to, actually at the time it was uh, uh, Gandhin Tri Rinpoche uh, was giving lectures in New Jersey on Buddhism and I, I knew nothing about it. I just was interested and intrigued. And so I went and heard uh, this lecture and pretty much immediately decided that I had to change everything that I was doing and I had to pursue study of Tibetan language because I wanted to uh, just be able to speak directly to amazing people like him. I was just, just it was like an aesthetic kind of shock and I just said, wow, this is, I just have to do this. So at that point, I left my um, undergraduate uh, program to the chagrin of my parents and uh, moved to New Jersey and started, I really wanted to study Tibetan language. And at that time, uh, my my main teacher was um, Tartse Kenrobche, who's uh, of, a, of the Sakya. And he, very soon after I got there, he accepted a post in California. So I followed him out to California which was at the end of the sixties. And, um, and then I, I continued to study Tibetan, lived in his Dharma center for a long time, but at the same time, I went back to school uh, at University of California at Berkeley. And so I was really pursuing a kind of double track. One was working with Tibetan teachers and one was working um, in academia, which didn't always make me happy, but that's what I did, so. <laughs> Okay, so um, you mentioned that you, I mean, you went to California and you actually studied at Berkeley, um, which has, a, of course, a worldwide reputation for the sort of hippie scene and the movement. So how was it there at that time when you went there? Well, I sort of arrived right at the end of the, so there was, what was it, People's Park, this very traumatic event when it was taken over by the police. And so I was, I really came there, I, I'd actually done, I'm remembering now, it was the end of 69 or 1970. That was kind of a shift. And so when I was in Berkeley, I was in Berkeley from 70 to 78, I guess. And 
at least my circle of friends, Dharma was the thing. So I was associated with Tartse Rinpoche, but Tartong Tuku was there. Um, this is when Trungpa first started uh, coming, and I met him on the on that very first um, uh, visit to the United States. And then we also hosted various uh, elder Tibetan teachers. So at least my group, my friends were very much into this Dharma scene, which was a big thing at that time. Um, yeah, but Berkeley was a very fun place and, and there was lots of things happening there. Yeah, I was going to say, how much did you sort of participate in that side of it? Or were you very much focused on, on the studies on the Buddhism at that time? What was I was very much focused on the Buddhism at that time. So, um, uh, I mean, you know, we were all part of a kind of countercultural kind of situation and our way of doing, you know, I was very, you know, I was not against hippies or anything and probably mm -hmm. dressed like them and looked like them and stuff. But, you know, it was very engrossing to be involved in Tibetan stuff. And we were all studying Tibetan language and, you know, a number of relatively well-known Tibetology scholars were also in that group. And I can remember there's this one place called the Mediterranean Cafe, which is on Telegraph Avenue, which I believe is still in existence. But I remember we would all pile in there with our Tibetan texts and try to impress each other about who knew the most and, you know, and stuff like that. So it was a real, it was a Dharma scene, basically, at least my wow. world. Yeah, I was going to say, can you can you mention some of the people who were in that scene then at that time? Maybe some well, of the, the names? The main person was Matthew Capstein. So we were kind of buddies in school and we were also studying Sanskrit at the same time as Tibetan. And then um, Stephen Goodman, who recently passed away and um, Ron Davidson, who is still, uh, I believe he's teaching, uh, still in Connecticut, um, are the most well-known of that group. And then there was a bunch of others but people came through like people like Keith Dalman was kind of hovering around and various characters of various sorts. Yeah. And uh, so at that time, I guess it was it was relatively new as well, right? All the Tibetan Buddhist scholarship and translation into English. So did you find that you were sort of inspiring each other? Did, was that group a kind of a sort of a self-inspiring muse in a way? No, it definitely was. Absolutely, it was. And we were we were learning from each other all the time. We would be turning each other on to different kinds of things, you know, and that's often the way things like this happen. You know, there's kind of a core group and they each, you know, it's somewhat, it's not really competitive, but each builds mm -hmm. on the other and, um, and you know, it, it makes it very exciting. So yes, that's true. And Shambhala Books was just beginning, and Shamb the, the only Shambhala Bookstore was right there across the street from the Mediterranean Cafe, wow. you know, and so yeah. all of these things were happening. So it was a very exciting time. Yes, it sounds good. And um, well, just moving into the sort of the language study then, because um, you studied Sanskrit um, and uh, also Tibetan, although you said you wanted to study Tibetan. Now, how important do you think it is for a practitioner, a Buddhist practitioner, to know the languages of these texts, um, such as the original source text? Um, do you think that that's really essential as a practitioner as well? Um, I don't know. That's a hard question to answer, and things have changed a lot. I myself, you know, a, a lot for me, about being a practitioner was also becoming uh, familiar with the culture and making friends with people and all that whole thing. So, you know, for somebody to be not associated with the culture and just like learning, you know, out of a translated book, which is, you know, I'm sure that's also very helpful for people's spiritual development. So it really depends on what you, why you're doing and what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I think also, um, as time goes on, well, no, that's not true. I think that it still is the case. If you really want to get into Tibetan Buddhism, in my opinion, it's a huge boon to be able to know the language, to understand the technical terminology, to have conversations with people, you know, and possibly to go inside to bed if possible and meet people and talk to them, you know, and yeah. stuff. So, but it's certainly not essential if you're trying to just do your own spiritual development mm -hmm. using the techniques and stuff. 
And um, so, what about Sanskrit then? So um, how did you find studying that at, at Berkeley? And uh, did you find that easier um, to study Sanskrit? No. So I remember when I was at Berkeley, there were like two groups of us. Some people thought that Sanskrit was harder and Tibetan is easier. And some people thought that Tibetan is uh, harder and Sanskrit is easier easier. So I was definitely in the group that liked Tibetan more than Sanskrit. Sanskrit, you learn it in a very, very different way. So we were compelled to learn Sanskrit. So those days when you're doing Buddhist studies, you had to do Sanskrit. That that actually is not true anymore. Uh, I'm very, I mean, for my scholarly work and intellectual work, knowing Sanskrit is a huge benefit. Um, and it's And it really helps you to understand a lot of things. But I did it for academic purposes. And I don't really read Sanskrit very well now. I can yes. if I have, you know, and I can use the dictionary. And I, you know, and I, you know, I study, I got a master's degree at Berkeley in San Sanskrit. So, right. but Tibetan is really the language that I use. Yes, yes. I, I feel the same way I, uh, when I studied Sanskrit um, at, at uh, Hamburg. But um, uh -huh. just moving on to then your, your PhD. So your PhD was on Tang Tong Gyalpo. Um, can, can you say a little bit about why why you chose that subject or that person? Yeah, um, um, for one thing, just to say that working on that really required expertise that none of my professors had. So my professors in Buddhism who were very, very good only knew Tibetan as the language that uh, you could find translated texts that were no longer existent in Sanskrit. They didn't know colloquial Tibetan. They didn't know literary Tibetan or any of that. But what happened was at Berkeley, we had a kind of extraordinary thing that happened, which was in the middle of the doctoral program, our professors decided to lead an expedition in, to Nepal to try to recover old Sanskrit manuscripts and they got funding and a bunch of the, our whole program really about 20 people went over to Nepal with the quite crazy idea of that we were going to trek around in the mountains and open up like stupas and try to get man manuscripts mm -hmm. and then bring them back to Berkeley mm -hmm. which even at that time I had never been there but I knew that was not a good idea but um, so, but for me, it became an opportunity to go there. It was the first time that I was in Asia, or really the first time I was outside of the United States. And I stayed there for a longer time. So after we finished our expedition in which we got no Sanskrit manuscripts of any kind, but we did learn a lot about uh, Tibetan Himalayan culture at the time. And it was amazing. But um, after that, I went to the I went back to Rajpur, which is where the Sakya Center was. And there happened to be a very old Lama living there. He was actually passing through and he was from the Tantong Gebo lineage. He was from Golok and he he was like a quote unquote crazy yogi type of guy. But he was like in his 80s, I think. Um, and I just intersected with him and became it was like, so I studied with him for maybe a month or so. And I actually, I had had a previous sort of understanding. I knew about Tantong Gyabo and I had a kind of connection with him even before that. But when I got back to Berkeley, uh, and then I was thinking about what I was going to do for my PhD Actually, I'm not remembering what happened, but I finally came to the decision. At that point, I also got married to a Tibetan guy while I was in India as well. So that got me into the Tibetan society. But then we moved to New York. Then I reconnected. I remember talking with Matthew Capstein, who was very learned about all these traditions. And I realized it would be a great idea to just work on the tradition of Tantong Yewo because um, he has so many different traditions that are you know, trace to him. And so just trying to figure out what kind of person he was and what kind of teacher he was. So that's really how it happened. Okay, thank you. Now, when talking about sort of translating text a little bit as well. Um, so with the Tang Tong Gyalpo and the PhD, um, because obviously you're, you're in a, a sort of a group of people who are quite, I guess, you know, some of the, the sort of founders or in terms of English translation of Tibetan Buddhist texts. So how did you sort of, when you, when you found words which were quite difficult to translate or some would say untranslatable, 
Um, did you choose to keep them in the original language or did you really try and translate them into uh, understandable English? I think I tried to translate them, but also keep the Tibetan in parentheses, you know, so there were many terms that we had that we had no precedent for translating these terms. So we had to make it up ourselves, whatever made sense to us, you know, in English. Yeah. Partially, you know, based on intellectual traditions in English and just our own imagination. But you know, our training was to, you know, all such terms, you know, then you have parentheses and give the Tibetan, which I still do to this very day, you know, because I am very much trained like a philology scholar. Yes. And I also <laughs> do think that the, you know, it's hard to really translate well um, and get capture the kind of nuances of, a, you know, and and I'm, I, I love Tibetan language. And, and so, um, you know, so I like to keep the Tibetan, but more and more publishers, I'm sure you know, are don't want the Tibetan in there because they want it to be re readable for a general audience. So then you put it in the footnote or you, you know, or something like that. So, yes, exactly. OK, well, um, you also mentioned that I, I was watching a previous talk you gave on translation in 2014 about um, how you found translation to be a special pleasure and one of the most pleasurable pleasurable things you do in the field and that certainly resonated with me I absolutely I love and adore translation so could you say more about that perhaps a little bit what, what, what do you find so pleasurable about it um it's something so there's both written translation and oral translation and I think I probably was talking about oral translation which is a very special thing where and I'm sure you know this where you kind of go into a quasi meditative state I mean you you have to pay very very close attention it's very demanding but you you know you you have to kind of shut off some of your own ideas and really try to hear what the teacher is saying and then to kind of communicate that which in itself is a great uh pleasure and honor because you're participating in a kind of mental space with a teacher um which is fantastic um but it's also something about code switching. So I think that there's something really interesting going from one code to another and that intermediate space where you go in between is like a free zone. I really like that space. It's very, very creative. It's, you know, and it it you're both bound by the text to, you know, honor what the text is actually saying and you're trying to get all the implications and the trajectories out of, you know, each sentence, and each word, uh, but at the same time, you know, rendering it in a different language system. So there's something, it's, it's extremely creative, even though it's mm -hmm. also, it's not like creative writing where you can say whatever you want, you're bound, but it's still extremely creative. So yeah, uh, yeah it is great. I do love translating. I, I still to the, something like your, it feels good in the brain. It's the brain <laughs> places when you're doing that. And I, I like being in that Tibetan space. I mean, the re, uh, listeners may or may not know that uh, Tibetan syntax. So the order of words in Tibetan is very different than English. And so like the, just the order in which you put concepts in, um, but something happens to you when you're speaking Tibetan and you, it changes your whole nervous system. And it's, I, I really like that feeling. Yes, I agree. Actually, when I heard you say this, uh, it sort of reminded me a bit of that kind of almost bliss, bliss emptiness, secret mantra, almost aspect of translating. Uh, and, and this is, this brought up a question for me, which was, you know, how important to you is it to have a real connection or devotion to either the text that you're translating or the teacher, if it's oral translation, is that important to you? To have devotion? With some kind of, if not devotion, at least some sort of real feeling or connection. Um, oh, very, very important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, um, you know, I do this because I love doing it. You know, I'm not like translating a scientific manual, you know, or... Mm -hmm something like that. I mean, although you you could get excited about that too, but um, <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, yes, yeah, it's very, very important. And it certainly helps a lot. Yes. Well, then moving on to the next question then, which is about 
why did you decide to become an academic? Because uh, the that's obviously it's not it's not the same as being a practitioner, of course. So what was the reason for that? To some degree, it was a it just was chance. Um, I I tell the story um, um, about when I first was admitted to Berkeley after I had left Boston University, and I had never imagined that I would be studying Tibetan or Buddhism, you know, in some sort of professional way. I thought that was going to be my practice and my side interest, but I was a math major actually at Boston. And uh, and uh, for some reason, when I was admitted, so I was admitted to Berkeley into the math program. And when I met my advisor, I kind of had this, uh, my, my new advisor, it was a strange thing where the, the guy, he didn't even know me, but he's telling me how hard math is. And he was trying to discourage me, which years later in retrospection, you know, maybe because I looked like a kind of hippie girl or something, and he didn't believe that I could do math or something, but I kept <laughs> saying to him, you know, I don't care whether it's competitive. I'm, I know I'm actually pretty good in math and I'm not worried about this, so I'm fine. And he kept saying, blah, 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 blah. And then just at that, it was all this kind of happenstance. I, I left his office and just at that moment, I, I ran into Professor Lou Lancaster who had just at that moment had gotten approved from the University of California to start a graduate program in Buddhist studies. And so I was just, I, I happened to knew, know him and I just was complaining that this stupid math advisor and he said, oh, well, why don't you just be a religion major and then you can go into our graduate program in Buddhist studies. And I, you know, we're just walking across the, the campus and I said, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. You know, in those days you kind of didn't take these things very seriously. And so I was just in that context, yeah. but, um, and I just kept going for the degree and and I still regarded myself as primarily like, you know, both a practitioner, but just also a participant in Tibetan culture. And then I moved back to New York, et cetera. And then all of a sudden I realized, you know, cause I was, I didn't have a proper job. And um, I realized, wait, I have a PhD in Buddhist studies. What do you do with a PhD? You teach in an academic program. Mm -hmm. And I really scrambled to get back into, and I was really lucky that uh, again, fortunate, coincidences I managed to you know after waiting a few years but it, there was there was at first and for a long time there was a, a discrepancy between how I understood being a practitioner and how I understood being a scholar hmm. um, as I got older and more into academia um, that discrepancy went away and I realized that um, you know I am sort of like an intellectual type person that I like doing this and there's some value in it, you know, and I might not be, I'm not like the total kind of blind faith type practitioner either. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it, it ended up suiting, suiting me pretty well. Um, and and how, how easy was it for you to do that as a woman? Because um, there are female academics in Buddhist studies, even now, uh, some of whom I know and have spoken to who still say that they experience their work being diminished or overlooked or um, they have to produce work which is, you know, 10 times as good uh, to get noticed. Um, and I myself, I have to be honest, have had that experience. Um, but at that time, um, when there were, I would imagine there were less women in the field um, than there are these days, how was it for you? So I only became aware of feminism and all of that stuff much later. So I'm just bopping along doing my thing. And it never occurred to me, you know, that being a woman had was anything, you know, it just, it, I just didn't even think of it although it certainly was operating even in my family which I only realize now um I don't um I did not experience it as a problem and I don't think that I really have I just you know didn't pay attention to it and I you know I I like I like both I like men and I like women but you know <laughs> I like being competitive with guys and, and, you know, and debating and stuff like that. And, um, you know, and, but I also like the, you know, and I do think there are some gender differences between the way women and men, you know, I mean, obviously this is 
gross generalizations, but <laughs> I do think there are interesting differences, but I, I, I don't think it, I'm just trying to think back. I don't think it really affected me in my academic career. I, I was, I've been quite aware that, um, um, you know, most of my colleagues have been guys, you know, so like we get together at the American Academy of Religion. And even now it's much, much more predominated by men than women, you know, amongst the guys I choose, the people who I like, you know, and who are open in a certain kind of way and stuff like that. Um, you know, so it's a complicated topic. Of, it, 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 of, yeah, you know, I mean, um, our, our not, academic yeah. standards, our academic standards gendered themselves is a kind of type of certain types of logic, certain types of consistency. You know, there's a whole issue like this in feminist stuff. Um, and so it's a very complicated issue. But I guess I've been fortunate enough to be able to find my niche. And I, I do, um, you know, feel like I pursued a path that, you know, maybe the topics that I, that I followed, you know, had particular interest to me because I was a woman, you know, that I wasn't necessarily focusing on women per se. Anyway, right. it's, it's a complicated topic. Yeah, I mean, and this is something that I also wanted to ask you about in terms of your own work, because as you said yourself, um, this is something you you actually chose to work on specifically. I'm talking about the book Women in Tibet, which is uh, actually kind of one of the first, I guess, major sort of books and compilations um, on women in Tibet and uh, with Anna Havnavik. And um, so what was the main inspiration and reason to do that then? Um, so you've done a PhD in Tantan Gyalpo, but then to do something like that. Well, before I did that, I was working on the Namtar of Jigme Lingpa. So that mm -hmm. was really my main project, which, right. you, and I do have a whole chapter in there on the Dakini, because obviously that's part, that's the way he titles his own autobiography. And he's very, very big fan factor and um, of course I'm intrigued by that to be honest the the woman in Tibet um, project was first of all it, it was started by Hannah Hannah and I knew each other and she asked me to join her to help her to edit and we would do it together and I said sure that's fine it was not a big you know thing for me I was very happy to do it and it was very interesting you know we didn't actually write our own article for that we just wrote the introduction um, and of course it's of interest and it has been of interest and I am very interested in, and I've gone on to do other things, but it, it wasn't out of like some strong Im impulse that, oh, we need to uncover women, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so okay, yeah, that's interesting. That That's very interesting to learn actually. And, um, and when that book came out um, and yeah, we'll get onto the Dakini and uh, Jigme Lingpa. This is also something that is very fascinating. But when the Women in Tibet book came out, how was that book treated and accepted by uh, men and women in the field? Um, what was the just sort of overall reaction to it? Um, I don't even know what the reaction was, but, um, <laughs> um, um, you know, I think it was accepted fine. I mean, all the articles in there are quite good, uh, very strong, you know, historically based some of the authors are men, some of the authors are women. I don't, I, nobody would have questioned that, oh, why are you focusing on women? I mean, you know, they're not, the field is not that bad. I mean, they, they, of course it's true. Everybody knows that, you know, that, you know, we, we hear less from women and why. And so I think, you know, there certainly was no critique or, or problem with it or anything. And as I say, was so I can't remember who's in that book anymore. Dan Martin wrote a very big thing in there. Tashi Tsuring. Um, who else? Um, most of them were women. So we had Helga Ubach, the German scholar, um, uh, Charlene Mackley. Um, uh, Hil was Hildegard in there? Or I don't even remember. Yeah, I, 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 I think so, yeah. Yeah, I haven't paid a lot of attention to that book. I tell one story um, about it it was mostly myself who wrote the introduction to that book and um so now when when was that book published can you let me know? <laughs> that's a good question actually i also didn't write the year down but i don't think it was that long ago right yeah 
um, so because I remember, so um, in the course of my life, just to get back to my life, you know, yeah. after I separated from my Tibetan husband, I, I ended up getting married again and mm-hmm. to a colleague who's also in Buddhist studies, Charlie Halsey. And he, you know, is someone who I knew before we became a couple. And I, I, he's really an interesting mind. I remember talking to him about this intro and he gave me the strong advice, which he has often given me like a little bit of advice and on different things, which, which have been really, really, really important. And he said, and, and he was trying to shift me away from the total emphasis on gender and, and turning my attention to social class as another, mm-hmm. you know, trajectory. And so I put in, you know, if you, if you've read that intro at any point, I put in a lot of stuff about that gender is only one of several factors that makes a difference in, you know, who gets published, who gets known, blah, 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 blah. So I was trying to kind of open up the sort of gender studies into other domains, which we, we now say intersectional with that, which I think was really a good thing to do. And and so, yeah, so I didn't see this as my feminist kind of track, you know, that I was doing, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I was very happy to do it. And I was very grateful to Hannah for bringing me into it. But it was really, she had actually collected most of the people or, already. Um, so it was okay. her project. Yeah. Well, okay. um, just to, before we talk about sort of autobiographies and secret uh, autobiographies, I just want to talk to you a little bit about your own uh, kind of feeling about Buddhism. What, what, what for you as a Buddhist practitioner? What does that mean to you personally? Um, it means um, <laughs> um, I believe in the very, very profound teachings of the Buddhism of suffering, of no self, and. Um, also the efficaciousness of certain practices. Um, so, you know, I was convinced when I first heard the Four Noble Truths, when right when I moved to New Jersey at that time, I was, when they said the first truth is truth of suffering, I was so happy to hear that because I had always been saying that. And my parents, my mother in particular, would say, no, 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 no. Oh, things it's not suffering. Why are you talking like that? And that's not, but I felt so relieved to find people who understood and agreed with it. Um, so it suits me, and it also, you know, I I can't dissociate the relationships I've had with especially uh Tibetan teachers, but also other Buddhist teachers. When I meet other Buddhist teachers or or even fellow practitioners there's something that we have in common so it is also social or it it has a kind of personal feeling of people who are on the same wavelength and you know and certainly the whole thing about compassion and all those kinds of things um, are very important to me yes and um well just turning then to sort of this uh subject of the liberation story the namta so um, the sentence that Kamapa recently has been teaching about the, the Namtar as being different from an ordinary biography, and it's not written like a worldly one. Um, and so you have translated the secret autobiographies of Jigni Lingpa. And um, so some people might say that, you know, um, such kind of material, um, especially if it's translated by unrealized non-practitioners, I'm not saying that you're not realized, but, you know, this is kind of the, the, the argument. Um, should not be translated for public use, general public use. In fact, as you know, some Tibetan Buddhist masters have forbidden it. Um, so is there a danger that it could be mistranslated and interpreted and misused and misunderstood by just the general public who are just buying the books? And I'm thinking in particular here, obviously, about the sort of the sexual yoga, the consort practices, because um, there is a great danger um, and, uh, you know, I've read material myself where people who obviously haven't actually done those practices are writing about them. And sometimes, you know, because they've not done it, they're making some quite big mistakes. So what's your general view on that? Well, um, so I can tell the story of how I came to the project. And that was yeah. absolutely my own concern at the time. So actually, it was Stephen Goodman 
who did his PhD thesis on the writings of Jigme Lingpa. And we had a, some small conference uh, in which he presented uh, some of the passages from the secret autobiography just in terms of part of his presentation. And I remember being very captivated and said, wow, that's such amazing writing. It's really beautiful. And I asked him right after the presentation, I said, are you going to be publishing on this? Are you going to translate that? That's an amazing text. And he said, no, no, no. Um, Tundrup and told me not to, uh, this is secret. Um, for whatever reason, I I already knew Tugu Tundrup or was getting to know him, and I asked him the same question about it. I just so so Steve assured me that he wasn't going to be working on it, and so I asked Tugu Tundrup the same question, and Tugu Tundrup uh, did not give me the same answer. He said, um, uh, "No, that would be okay." You know, especially he understood what what my interest was in it, which was to kind of display to the world the brilliance of Tibetan Buddhist writing and and how it's an amazing text. Um, and Tugu Tundra, uh, you know, uh, I read the whole text with him in Tibetan, but I before I decided to take on the project, um, I also consulted with a bunch of other people, including uh, Dunjum Rinpoche, including uh, Dodobchen Rinpoche, you know, so Dodobchen, is the reincarnation of the disciple of Jigme Lingpa. And I also um, eventually went to Kathmandu and and to ask some difficult questions to, about the text with uh, um, Dingo Kensei Rinpoche, who is the reincarnation of Jigme Lingpa himself. I was really afraid that he was going to put a halt because he was famous for not wanting these texts, but he never did with me. Uh, the one thing that he did, so so what 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 happened was I read the text thoroughly with Tuku Tundrup, and I also read the text thoroughly with Kempo Belden Sharap, who was in New York at the time, who I knew also. So part of the thing about translating it and understanding it, I was like getting the instructions from a lot of different people uh, who all were qualified to talk about it much more than me. But even they had problems with some of the lines. Mm -hmm. And so we went to Dodob Chen and he explained a couple of things that were there. They all knew what I was doing. This was going to be an academic publication, but it would be available. And um, uh, so uh, Dingo Ken said, so, but we still couldn't solve all of the problems and um, in terms of certain lines. And I went to Nepal specifically to get interviews with Dingo Ken say, to ask him about this. And I thought, he was going to send me, what, are you translating this? That's absolutely, but he never said anything like that. He did tell me there was one line with a certain term, which we didn't understand, nobody understood, you know, including all these other lamas. And he told me, um, just don't translate that um, line, just put it in Tibetan in your English translation. And and so I did. I don't know if anyone has ever noticed it, but there's a line, it's just like, it's all of a sudden there's a line in Tibetan. And um, and I did that, but they and I also spoke with Namka Norbu about this um, this problem as well. So I did, you know, very thoroughly uh, research it, and you know, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, so that both answers the question of permission, but also uh, the question of doing an, a proper translation. Yeah, 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 and having sort of maybe some experiential uh, sort of insight in that. Actually, this kind of again reminds me of something you said in 2014 at the translation conference you spoke at, and you're talking about the lung and uh, getting a transmission of a text and um, how, uh, for example, I remember uh, when I was at Hamburg, Professor Doji Wangchuk said to me, you know, who who started the lung? I mean, can anyone give the first date of the first lung? Uh, and this is a, you know, this seems to be a very Tibetan thing, you know, with the lung and the transmission. <clears throat> In terms of you know sort of sitting there for weeks or days getting a lung and and you mentioned the sort of kind of secret uh, aspect of the lung you know the raised eyebrow um which um i think i can do one but um you know it's it's is that something that um because this is what people talk about with the sort of secret material that there should be that element of lung that element of blessing that element of experience coming through the translation. 
What do you think about that? I mean, is is that present there? Would you say in your translation of that those, that that autobiography? I feel that I I could have, you know, one thing, and I may well do it at some point. I don't know or not. I could have made the translation somewhat more poetic than I tried to make it very literal and poetic, you know. Um, so, but. Um, you know, it's not as poetic as it might be. Jigme Ling was a beautiful writer. And, you know, to convey his writing in English, I should have taken a little bit more liberty with the text to make it more poetic. But yeah. I do think that I do think that the transmission is there. I think that I myself, first of all, I myself did have, you know, some practice. I did have access to some of the things he was talking about myself but you know much more importantly I received it from the teachers who were telling me we went every single line you know uh you know extensive discussions about what he was talking about like I spaced out into the into the you know zone of you know pure vision and people were critiquing me like you know don't use the word spaced out because that's like a bad term but you know that's literally what it says in Tibetan <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and, you know, um, you know, the, the text operates on different levels, uh, for different readers that the notion of self secret is there, which is that, you know, people can read it and, and depending on who they are, will get different levels of meaning. Yes. I also think it's very, very important. Also, that was why I did it was to show the world that, you know, the Tibetan writing is not just like a blind faith sort of, you know, doctrinal and to show the, first of all, the fact that there's this kind of personal autobiographical writing is a very, very important thing in academics who are, you know, saying that there's no such thing as personal writing in Buddhism because Buddhism mm -hmm. doesn't believe in the self. And and that's wrong. And that's that's a misunderstanding. That's an orientalization or essentialization. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that trumps the issue about the 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 secrecy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So but well, just to let you know, that I, I was I was very worried about this, too. So I was very, yes. very careful. Nobody. These, not a single of these, you know, qualified masters said, oh, no, this is not a good idea. Yes, you shouldn't do this. Yes, they all yes. understood why I was doing it, and they all encouraged me and helped me. Okay, that, that that's, that's great to hear. I mean, uh, some scholars will just translate without that, as I'm sure you know. Um, but um, so speaking about space and, uh, you know, the Dakini principle and Jigni Lingpo, of course, this is a big, uh, this is a big chapter in the book about that, which I am also very fascinated in is the Dakini and the Dakini language. Um, so perhaps you could just, uh, because you talk about uh, the Dakini in, in this chapter in the book, and I, I just read a quote here, you say, you know, just as she, the Dakini, prevents Jigme Lingpa, Lingpa from becoming either too full of himself or too unfull, the Dakini herself resists being pinned down too precisely as this. And then you go on a bit further to say, um, and each reader would have to arouse his or her Dakini aspect in order to re read and receive the message of the text. So I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to that, because um, first of all, there is the mystery of the Dakini, which you do sort of talk about in this chapter. But by the end of the chapter, you suggest that, in fact, um, Jigme Lingbo or this, 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 this Dakini talk is actually for the Dakini. So the reader themselves have to become the Dakini to get the message. Is that right? I think. I think I got the that interpretation from the, another person that I didn't mention was uh, Kempo Jigme Punsok from mm -hmm. Serta. Yeah. And I asked him, you know, why did Jigme Lingpa say that the author of his text was the Dakini? And I believe that that uh, part of his answer was that the reader also has to become a Dakini to understand what the text is saying. And uh, I think that's a beautiful literary theory, actually. It's about this very high level of sophisticated literary writing. Um, that's true. 
And that's the power of a text, you know, just like po poetry or other kinds of very poetic writing can, you know, change the subjective state of the reader. Um, and in order to, to take in what's happening, you have to meet the author or the or the words halfway. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's true. And uh, again, that was so exciting. What's so exciting about this text is so, it's a, you know, really brilliant work. Uh, yes. You know, when I, when I really tried to analyze, you know, the more I got into it and I, I realized the way he was constructing the work and all the things that were going on in there, you know, after staring at it for years and, you know, and reading it with so many different people. Yeah, I mean, and, and the way, of course, the Dakini, Dakini is actually portrayed often as extreme, sometimes very problematic, very troubling, you know, sort of very direct, kind of almost annoying. Um, I think as Kandra and Pichet said, you know, being called a darkini is not always a compliment, in fact, and, and many people find this kind of woman or uh, messenger, if you like, uh, a little bit challenging and annoying at times. Now, why is it then that sort of women who are perhaps like that in sort of contemporary 21st century life, um, you know, their sort of message, you know, if we think about sort of women in Buddhism as scholars, translators and practitioners, you know, some of the biggest barriers that they face is also still being seen as, you know, maybe to uh, to this or to that, you know, and, and in the Buddhist studies field, especially, that seems kind of a little bit bit odd. What do you think of that? Um, you know, it's all about skillful mean and how skillfully you do it. The Dakini, you know, unsettles conceptions, as you know very well, and that's the job. And, um, you know, that, so when we were talking earlier about translation and that intermediate space when you're doing, that is really like a Dakini space, you know, of unformulated um, space. Um, and, you know, I don't believe that only women, you know, can thrive there. I mean, Jigme Lingbo was a man, uh, you know, um, I think many artists and poets are in that space. It's always a little bit harder because you're challenging the system, you're anti, you know, institutional, so you have to do it well. And there's, you know, people do it and they don't do it that well. They're just challenging. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're challenging or they don't understand how their, their message is being received by others. So it's not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, um, you know, it's not impossible and, okay. and, and people, you know, when you, when you start to use the, the Dakini kind of idea as a category, you notice it functioning in all kinds of ways. And it's really not limited to women only mm -hmm. at all. And, and, you know, so, um, you know, that's just the challenge. That's what makes yes. it exciting. And, and you know, people can use their own creativity. It's what's, it's empowering to know that this is a possible space, but that doesn't mean you can just go, blah, 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 and not even know what you're saying. You know, that doesn't count and that's not going to get you anywhere. You know, you, you have yeah. to understand how you're positioning and you have to understand the system in order to challenge it. It's like the great impressionist artists you know, they didn't just like randomly paint, at least at first they were trained in the system, you know, and this is like the tantric stories are like that too. You get trained mm -hmm. in the system and then you start to attack it at the edges and deconstruct it after, after you constructed it. So, yes, well, that, that is nicely onto, you know, you mentioned the tantric system and of course, um, you know, the roots of Vajrayana are very much with, you know, sort of Indian yoginis and, and yogis and the, the Mahasiddhas. And, um, and yet, um, you know, as you, you hosted an interesting talk recently with the 17th come up at Harvard University on gender equality and empowerment. And so there still seems to be those, some, particularly in the monastic system, um, which seems to have actually taken over Vajrayana to some extent, certainly in, in Tibet, um, that, you know, women are still not really at the forefront as they used to be in India in Vajrayana. Uh, for example, at the recent Global Buddhist Summit in India, the speakers were still overwhelmingly male and there were no female speakers on the main panels. 
Um, and Treasury of Lies, for instance, has, has just recently announced that, you know, only, I think, 20% of their biographies are of women. So there does seem to be this kind of still, even in the 21st century, a real gap between words and, and actions and actual presence of women. So what was the reason for that? Why, why, why are we still sort of not really visible at these sorts of events and, you know, on the, for example, the Treasury of Lives uh, website? Well, the Treasury of Lives website, I mean, the, part of the problem is we don't know about that many women, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, so there's no question that, um, you know, Tibetan Buddhism has been androcentric throughout its history, if not misogynist in, in many ways. And Buddhism has a very large, andro you know, not every part of Buddhism and not every single person and not every single text, but it's a strong um impetus and it's as strong everywhere else in the world too i mean it's it's about power and you know do i think that men anywhere like in the tibetan buddhist world or in the western world or anywhere else you know are you know really enlightened about women i think it's still very rare to find men because they have the power why should they give it up and they do have this it's a it goes very 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 deep you know, the gender power dynamics and sexual dynamics. And, you know, that's a huge, huge problem. Um, and do I'm not sure that I even believe that Indian tantric Buddhism had, you know, the leaders were women. You know, I, for example, the, the book by Miranda Shaw that she wrote a mm -hmm. long time ago, I think a lot of it, I think that's wishful thinking. I don't think it's true. Mm -hmm. And and I think that when you look closely at some of those tantric texts, you know, which she says are like centering women, I'm not sure that those are real women. I think that those can be a male fantasy of what mm -hmm. women are. I think today our society is fighting very, very hard to realize what true female leadership, what female wisdom is about. I don't think we're there at all, you know, still. Yeah, so he still has some way to go. Um, Including Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, thank you so very much for sharing your thoughts on that, on, on women in Buddhism. It's really fascinating and could, could talk forever about this. But um, I thought now we could move on as well now to talking about your work in relation to animals. Um, now, could you just explain a little bit about your background in uh, sort of animal rights and ethics? So, you know, how long have you been interested in that and what got you interested in it? Um, so, um, so having, you know, done a fair, not a huge amount of publishing, but a fair amount of publishing, which is what you're supposed to do when you're an academic. And I did do another book, which took me a very long time on Tibetan medicine, um, which, you know, occupied me for, and I had to do a huge amount of research and working with uh, Tibetan scholars and finish that and then decide, you know, I'm reaching kind of, you know, elderly status and, um, and I decided that I wanted to, I don't know exactly how I came to the decision, but I decided I wanted to write about something that was, it's really outside my realm of expertise, but it's something that's been close to my heart ever since I was one years old. <laughs> so I, I have been, you know, a huge animal lover my entire life. And I am, you know, uh, overwhelmed with grief and horror at the way that we're treating animals on our planet. And I feel so terrible about it. And it's such an error on the part yes. of human beings. And so I just made the decision that I'm now going to write a book that is outside my field, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Um, so right. that's what I do. Well, um, you know, before we talk about that book and the work, so um, what kind of uh, influences have you had in this? So you mentioned since you were one, you've been an animal lover. Um, and, and I agree with you. I mean, I'm horrified by particularly the mass farming industry and slaughter of, of animals for meat. But are you familiar with the work of Peter Singer, who in the, the 70s, in fact, was one of the first to talk about speciesism and animal rights? And what do you think of his work? Oh, it was revolutionary. It was very, very important. I'm just uh, in part of my book is just in fact, I have Peter Singer. Okay. This is the e copy oh, of wow. his of, of, of his book. I'm just at that point where I'm writing about utilitarianism. You know, mm -hmm. 
he he there's you know the world of philosophy has a lot of debates and you know and so he's been critiqued in certain kinds of ways but his basic emphasis on suffering is absolutely fantastic mm. you know um uh so i think it's uh, it's really really important okay. you know talk about people not wanting to give up their privilege you know um we're smarter and strong we're not necessarily smarter but we know how to dominate animals and we're strong and if we can we will because bottom line is we just want to eat that meat and, yeah. and any kind of logical reasoning or anything else you know you have to be really really committed to animals to change <coughs> to change your habits <coughs> well um I mean, are you a vegetarian or a vegan yourself? Because um, the other the other thing is not just the Buddhism, which of course, as I'm sure you know, Buddha taught uh, many times, you know, not to, people not to eat slaughtered animals in particular, um, but environmentalists as well, such as Singer and um, Jonathan Safran Foer said, you know, it, it's no longer <coughs> compatible to say you're an environmentalist and an animal lover at the same time and eat, uh, you know, murdered animals. So what's your view on that then? And the whole, you know, why are people, yeah, still eating murdered animals? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have been slowly evolving. I'm not a full vegetarian at this point, but I am <coughs> getting closer and closer. It's been a struggle. So I will, under, I'm a perfect example of a person who absolutely adores animals and then will close their eyes and eat that steak <clears throat> although i don't need steak now and I, i'm really getting very close and not only vegetarian but vegan because the dairy industry even if you're not killing them it's absolutely horrific the way mm -hmm. they treat calves and get, so the dairy industry is horrible but there are so it's a very complicated issue i am going to try to address this in my book um mm -hmm. There is also questions about the sustainability of a pure vegan diet on our planet because of the, um, um, you know, uh, soybeans and other products that we have to grow in mass numbers. It's a it's, what exactly is the right thing to do at this oh. point is very difficult to say. I think. What, what the primary principle of my book at the moment is don't let the perfect uh, get in the way of the good. So just mm -hmm. because you're not 100% consistent, and even a vegetarian, you know, there's so many other things that you would have to cut out if you're really going to, you know, absolutely police, you know, the use of an, any animal products would be huge. Um, it's a very, very complicated issue, but the cool. the more we can do it, the better is, is my view although yes. at this point um you know eating beef and lamb i i mean i to be honest i love lamb chops and and i can oh. um, <laughs> cite the oh, the, yes, the karmapa the the karmapa speech that he gave us at harvard because he has been mm. you know a big advocate um as other tibetan teachers have and he talked about how much he loves meat and how when he went, you know, he's had this feeling for a long time, but um, uh, he's still been eating meat, you know, coming from a, a meat eating society. And uh, when he finally became convinced that he could no longer mm -hmm. eat meat was the first time that he visited the United States. And all of his disciples had been telling him for years that, oh, where do you go to the U U.S.? You can get delicious barbecue and he 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 spoke about how he was driving around like in the south or someone and there were all these barbecues and his mm -hmm. mouth was watery but it, it was too late <laughs> because yeah. he, he already you know made the vow but it just it spoke i was so glad to hear that because it spoke to how hard it is i mean some people yeah. find it easier than others some people are just less attached to eating any meat than others yeah. but it's very very hard it's a struggle um, but um, well, and it takes willpower and discipline. Yes, it does. I mean, I, I came from a meat eating background and it's not easy, but certainly I think it's worth it. But the thing is, in terms of Buddhism, if we go to the sort of Buddhist idea, you know, as the 17th Karmapa has said many times in his teachings on vegetarianism, 
And the Buddha has said, you know, breaches Vinaya, for example. Um, and people assume that Tibetan Buddhist masters were not vegetarians, right? Because they're in Tibet and they there's not much plant food there. But um, as I'm sure you know, the, the scholar Jeffrey Barstow wrote about the fact that there were actually many great Tibetan Buddhist masters who were strict vegetarians prior to um, 1959, which is very difficult there. So they were eating sampo or, you know, butter and tea. Um, and um, and I guess that's a kind of an inspiration as well, right? The sort of people who are outside of Tibet, you know, certainly in India, there's a huge amount of sort of plant food. So it's always been very easy to be vegetarian in India. But um, what do you think about that? I mean, why do people still hold on to this idea that, you know, Tibetans or Tibetan Buddhist masters could not be vegetarian when there are so many examples of, of people who were? Well, I'm not sure that people are saying that they couldn't. Um, mm -hmm. It's difficult. And I don't uh, think that there weren't so many. Ma Some of the great masters were. So one in one of Jeffrey Barstow's books, uh, he mm -hmm. does talk about Tibetan masters who made the case that it was okay to eat meat in a certain kind of context, especially there's a whole debate about the ritual, the Gana Chakra kind of thing, and, and what do you do there? Uh, I think it was relatively rare uh, in Tibet for people. I mean, a lot of people couldn't afford to eat meat, so you didn't get meat that frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, and and also, I will just say that the dairy industry in you know producing butter and cheese was quite different than it is now. So there, the practices are not so cruel. So that would be a viable option where you're not inflicting huge suffering on these an animals, but. There, there weren't that many people who, who you know, and the majority of Tibetans are, you know, kind of, you know, quite um, voracious meat eaters. When you <laughs> put a meat in front of the, them, they really like it. And it is it is because of, you know, dietary thing. They need the protein. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a huge thing. People need the education of how do you get enough protein if you're not going to yeah. eat animal products. It means you have to pay a lot of attention to your diet, you know, and yes. not to take the easy way out. So it's complicated, but I do think that we must, you know, try to do that as much as we can. Yeah, although, as you know, I'm based in India and the yogic diet is traditionally vegetarian, right? So many Indian yogis would just say, you know, it's always been like that. We've never had to sort of have issues with getting meat into our diet and because that's of, because of dal so people eat dal, dal, and exactly. rice. And dal and rice is a full protein so yeah in india and other parts that those parts of the world it is much easier so it yeah is, yeah so but tell us tell us please a little bit about your book um and what it what what is it covering what sort of subjects are you, are you looking at there so my it, my book is kind of emerging you know, in a way, it's it's a very complicated and difficult book to write, but um, Buddhist ideas are certainly in there, and I'm going, and um, I'm, I'm using um, Buddhist principles of compassion, and I'm also using um, Buddhist disciplinary and meditative techniques because um, so the purpose of the book is to encourage people to notice and recognize how brilliant and how amazing animals and how they're not just objects, but how to, to really love animals more. And then take a hard at the implication their lifestyle and how that impacts animals. So I have a whole chapter on um, just in praise of, you know, it's a kind of phenomenological look at the way animals live in the world. I mean, I love animals so much that I often feel like animals are, you know, much higher than humans uh, in many ways. And, you know, um, and uh, so just trying to draw people's attention more and more. And, you know, the, the science is following this as well. So there's been a lot of recent research on how much more, more intelligent many, many different species are than we thought that they were. So we're actually realizing that so much complex stuff is going on. And so, you know, the more you recognize how 
you know, creative and brilliant and beautiful animals are, the more the, it's going to be more difficult for you to to murder them, as you say, you know, or yes. not only murder. Yeah. I'm actually to be honest. I'm more upset about the practices that keep animals confined mm -hmm. and the way they live their life than the actual murder per se. You know, so that's why I'm somewhat, you know, if, you know, if you really are, you know, a, a swift death after a life of happiness is far less of a problem than a prolonged life in cramped quarters in this horrible way that you can't even live like your normal life. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm much more upset mm -hmm. about that. Any, mm -hmm. Anyway, so the book is going through a lot of my own observation of animals. A lot of it is coming out of my experience with my own cats. Um, I'm a cat lover, as you can see in my photo. Um, but other animals, Instagram has an enormous amount of raw footage of animals in the wild, of all kinds of stuff, which is just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And then I, in the final chapter, I am, I am planning to um, uh, propose different sorts of practices, some of which will be based on Buddhist practice, but adapting them. So for example, one practice of like, adapting mindfulness practice uh, to animal observation. So, uh, uh, you know, spending 20 minutes, say, for example, or a half an hour with your pet, letting them lead the way, um, just uh, allowing, you know, just paying attention to what they want, as opposed to what you're imposing, you know, trying to bracket our human projections on to animals. I'll, I'll also introduce some visualization techniques that, you know, in in Tibetan Buddhism, you know, practices of imagining, you know, what life is like for animals, you know, you know, the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, you know, um, somehow shedding light on animals, all sorts of different practices to try. I'm hoping that my readers will be persuaded by the writing to engage in the disciplinary self-restraint that they that they're going to need in order to change their practices it's a very complicated it's a very well, complicated it sounds fascinating and wonderful and uh, looking very much forward to reading that. To, to end this uh, this interview then i just wanted to ask you about what is obviously a very um important and serious topic is the sexual misconduct of some of the tibetan buddhist lamas towards women in particular, and the fact that more and more women are feeling more and more able to come forward and, and uh, speak about this, um, myself included. So um, what's your view on that? And, and how can we help and support women more when they, when they choose to do that? Well, we certainly do and should support women when they choose to do that. You know, I've been very dismayed and disheartened um, about this has been going on for some time. The problem is, is that it's all intermixed with the tantric sexual practices, the kind of idea of pure vision. They, you know, the, the defense of these lamas is like, oh, you don't have pure vision. You, you looked at this through your worldly perception, but actually what he was doing was giving you the highest tantric, you know, um, and I don't buy that. And I think people are very easily using the pure vision. And I, I, I'm I, very worried about the fate of Tibetan Buddhism, especially in the West, because of this. Um, you know, it's also happening in Asia, as the recent thing with the boy and the Dalai Lama. So it's not a pure white, you know, Asian kind of thing. I also think that... Um, you know, we need to ratchet down our expectations of Tibetan lamas as being enlightened Buddhas, hundred percent. You know, the red, this talking about pure vision and seeing the guru—that's really a kind of very esoteric practice. You can't, uh, you know, that's why it was esoteric. This is what happens when tantra is exposed too broadly, and you know. The Tibetan community is not the only place that is having this. You know, look at the United States. We're supposedly so advanced. We're not. It happens over and over and over again. 
so it's a horrible problem. Um, but I, the, the best thing that could be done is number one, I think figures like the Dalai Lama and other leaders should make a really strong statement on this. Like, you know, I don't care what type of Tibetan Buddhism you are teaching. You have to absolutely, um, you know, show absolute restraint and don't just presume that because, you know, you've been given some title that you, everything you do now is perfect compassion. And that's, that's self-delusion. And so uh, uh, Tibetan teachers have to be far, far, far more restrained. And on the other hand, admit that they're not, these are teachers, but they're not perfect. Mm. And uh, we need to go forward from that. But I think there's been enormous damage done. You know, I know people in the, you know, in the Vajradhatu community, for example, you know, and many others who have just been, they're totally confused. They don't know what to make of this, you know, and we need to ratchet down the rhetoric and, yeah. and make and make it all a far more, a somewhat more worldly endeavor than people are willing to admit. Um, mm. But I'm very well, sad I think about it. You know, the, the thing is, that as, as I could speak as someone who is a survivor who has spoken out about it, I do think that even sometimes people who say they support and are advocates of survivors don't necessarily support those voices, very few voices who give first-person testimony on it. And uh, I think that's also another issue, that I think that even within the Buddhist studies field or practitioners in the communities, like you say, because of all the pure perception, we also, I think, have to sort of watch out, not you know, to not to shun or to cancel or all that sort of thing, people who have bravely, I think, chosen to speak out because it's very difficult to speak out. It is not an easy thing to speak out. And the suggestion that someone would speak out to get a name for themselves is just ri ridiculous. I mean, the, the loss and the bullying and the and so on is, is, is not in anyone's interest to do that. But, um, but obviously, I agree. It's a big topic. I agree. And, you know, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And I agree that, you know, people are quite reticent when it comes down to it, when you hear that someone has been doing something and that someone is someone you like and you're working with, you really want to say, oh, no, that's nothing. I don't want to hear this complaint. So the culture, I agree, the culture is very, very hard for survivors who come forward. And I also agree with you that the idea that they're they're doing that, um, you know, to get a name for themselves. Um, it's again a very very complicated cultural issue, and it's again it's absolutely horrible. But um, I yeah, don't know what to I think maybe some of these incidents, uh, like you mentioned, you know, maybe these are the starting points in a way to start talking about, you know, cross cultural children's rights or cross cultural women's rights and physical boundaries. And, you know, regardless of a cultural norm, you know, to sort of understand, you know, physical boundaries, because it's not just women, but children as well, who, you know, traditionally, certainly in patriarchal societies, you know, are, are seen as kind of open targets, I suppose. And uh, I, I think that, you know, the cultural norm idea is not necessarily such a strong one anymore, right, that we are looking at a more cross because Cultural norms are changing very quickly everywhere, right. you know. Yeah. So we have to make um, new cultural norms. Exactly. Well, Professor Gyatso, it's been an absolute pleasure and delight to have you uh, as the guest on Zakini Conversations. And uh, I'd just like to thank you very much again. And uh, also really looking forward to reading your new book on, on animals. So once it's finished. Once it's finished. And when will yeah. that be, do you think? When will it I don't know. I'm I'm on sabbatical this year, and it's very very hard. But I am I am using strong willpower and discipline. I'm hoping to have a draft by the end of December. But there's so many problematic issues. I could go into detail. That this very 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 challenging book to write. But I'm very committed to it. So I hope in a couple of years. That's all I can say. Oh, wonderful! Well, I look forward to reading that. And and thank you very much again. Okay, very nice to meet you also. And very yes, nice let's, keep, let's keep our, our connection and feel free to be in touch anytime. And also, if you want to follow up, you know, or anything or whatever, just feel feel free to be in touch. Okay. Thank you very much. All right.